Hello everyone, my name is Stephen and this is my testimony of being healed of fear, anxiety, panic, and all of these are symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. And the purpose of this um, video is to bring encouragement to all of you who suffer with some form of anxiety. Um, there are many statistics out there that tell us that there are millions and millions of Americans, uh, 30 million on up, who are medicated for some form of anxiety. Um, so I want to bring you hope that you can get healed and you are very close to being healed. Uh, it might take a little bit of homework as it was in my case, but healing is possible. And when I say healing, I don't mean just um, you feel a little bit better and you're managing your symptoms. I mean healed. I mean you are full of hope, you are full of wellness, and you are full of calm. Um, that is my life. I, I had 30 plus years of this fear, stress, anxiety, nervousness, panic. And so I'm speaking from experience. Um, and I'm, and I'm, I'm standing with you that I know what you're going through. Um, and I want to give you hope. Um, this is the first and I hope a series of many videos where I walk you through what I went through so that you can get healed. Um, so this is more of an overview of how I got here and I'm going to, uh, in, in future uh, videos, uh, give you very brass tacks details of how you can get free. Uh, and before I start, I want to give you a little bit of background of just who, who I am and, and where I came from and how, how all this started. Um, when I was a year old, my arm was broken. Um, now, it's still shrouded in mystery 50 years later. Um, what happened? And because of that, um, I didn't know for many, many years that that type of trauma would have any effect on me as an adult. Um, so the reason, well, I, I'll go back and say that my arm was broken. How do I know that? Well, we have photographs of me with a cast on my arm. And all that my um, parents would tell me is that they don't know. They didn't know how, what happened. So uh, you that are parents know that children's bones are very supple, that toddlers learning how to walk, they fall all the time. They get up, they fall. They get up, they fall. And that's very normal. And God made... Um, Children's uh, little toddlers, they, he made their bones supple and, and pliable so that when they fall down, they don't break. So to break a bone at a year old, something very uh, extraordinary had to have happened. And unfortunately, we don't know what happened. Over the course of the last 25, 30 years, I've had some clues that have told me what possibly could have happened. Um, and it doesn't really matter at this point. Um, this video is not to find the root cause or to blame anybody, but something not too good happened, and it caused great trauma to me um, as only a one-year-old. Now, I don't have much memory of fear or anxiety as a, a toddler, but my first memories of, of real panic began in kindergarten. Um, my first day of being put on a bus to go to school was extremely traumatic and the, the separation anxiety was horrible. And if you can picture a cat uh, going into a bathtub to try to take a bath, uh, that was me going onto the bus as a kindergartner because it scared me to death. Um, fortunately for me, I have a twin sister and that brought me great comfort knowing there was someone with me. And so uh, the first you know, <laughs> hour or so of trying to get me on the bus was a, a, a giant war and a battle. But I got on the bus, and my sister and I went to school, and that was that. The next year, however, in first grade, she and I were separated, and so that caused me more anxiety. <laughs> and so because of that, uh, I have distinct memories of, a, of being a first grader with great separation anxiety, social anxiety, panic. Um, and at that age, you don't know what's going on, and so I didn't even have the words to say, uh, help, I'm going bonkers. <laughs> and so um, one of my memories of first grade is checking out. Uh, I, I think I, I zoned out a lot. Uh, thank, how I passed first grade, I don't know, but I did. Uh, but I do have a distinct memory of one day when I was in, you know, in my mind, in la-la land somewhere, 
and the teacher getting angry. And we were working on an assignment, and she decided to pick up the whole class and go outside to play with on the playground, except for me. She was going to prove a point, whatever point that was, but she was going to make me sit in the classroom with my assignment. And since I was checked out due to, you know, having anxiety problems, I didn't know what was going on. And so all I knew is that everybody's gone and I'm here at my desk and I just started bawling and crying. And another teacher heard me, you know, sobbing at my desk and she came in and said, okay, you can go outside too. She, you know, took pity on me. And so that was um, uh, first grade. Um, second grade, we moved to a new city. And and I was spent a lot of time outdoors doing sports, hanging out in the woods and in the fields and streams and creeks, and that seemed to be um, very therapeutic for me. And until junior high, seventh grade, eighth grade, that's when panic and fear and anxiety really became cr literally crippling. Um, in both my seventh and eighth grade years, uh, uh, I, I went through puberty. And in and, and both years, I had tremendous bouts of agoraphobia. So the fear had just blossomed and anxiety blossomed to the point where I could not leave home. I was so uh, ridden with fear and anxiety and panic. And um, at, at, in eighth grade, when this happened, I, I had missed two weeks of school. I think it was at least two weeks of school, both years. And um, in eighth grade, my parents... Um, and I never told my parents what the reason was. I just said, I'm sick. I can't go to school. I'm sick. And, and it bought me some time. But at some point they said, you know what? If you really are this sick, we got to take you to a doctor. And so I, I also, I said, sure, I'll go to a doctor. But I didn't feel safe enough to tell them, uh, by the way, mom, dad, I'm going crazy. <laughs> Fear is overtaking my life. Um, I didn't feel safe to tell them that. And so I didn't. I just feigned, you know, stomach sickness or whatever it was. So they, they drug me to the hospital, to the doctor uh, in eighth grade, and they took my blood, and, you know, the doctor poked me and prodded me. And at the end of all his tests, he said, you know what, you're healthy. You're physically healthy. And in his very reassuring, calm voice, he said, you're healthy. I want you to get some fresh air and get outside, because I think he knew that I was just really under a lot of stress, and I just couldn't handle it. And so just his reassuring voice told me, yeah, I think I can get through this. I can get through. And so th through the rest of my high school years, uh, I, I didn't suffer that much um, fear, stress, anxiety. I mean, there was the normal, um, normal stress and fears that you have as a, as a kid. But then around the age of 15 and 16, I, I discovered this wonderful thing called alcohol. Ooh. I was now able to medicate myself. I didn't need a doctor. I could get drunk. So from about the age, definitely the age of you know, 15, but 16, 17, 18, my friends and I went and got drunk every weekend. As, as often as we could get our hands on alcohol, which surprisingly was not that hard, we, we did that. And that continued for many, many years. That was, alcohol was my drug of choice. Uh, I just wanted to anesthetize myself from the pain that was in my heart and, and to, to curb the anxiety. When I was 18, I moved to Los Angeles. I went to school. I got involved in all plethora of, of things that were diversions that were, again, self-medicating, uh, taking advantage of women, taking advantage of alcohol, taking advantage of sun and surf and good times. Life was a party. But as we all know, the party has to end at some point. At the age of 22, I decided it was going to be a really great idea that one of these women I was involved with, that she, she and I should get married. Um, using women and alcohol to try to um, make yourself feel better is not a very good way to start a marriage, <laughs> as you can only imagine. Um, so that um, situation put me in a huge pressure cooker. Um, very quickly, I knew I had made a huge mistake. And um, I, from the age of 22 to about 24, 5, 6, um, it was at one fight after another, and it was a giant disaster. And my fear and stress and anxiety didn't get less. It got bigger. It, it grew um, to the point where I, I knew something great had to happen to change. And at this point, uh, I was... 25, 26, and I knew that alcohol was no longer working, that 
it didn't do it wasn't helping anymore that my marriage was just in a shambles that wasn't helping me nothing was helping on St. Patrick's Day 1996 uh, I was invited to a St. Patrick's Day party and I went to the party thinking alcohol doesn't work anymore I may have one drink and I'm going to go home well <laughs> I had my one drink, and uh, at this party, uh, I'll give you a little background of this party. It was one of the oddest parties I think I've ever been to. Uh, I lived in a college town outside of Los, downtown Los Angeles. And at this party, this party was held at the law firm of uh, a local attorney. And um, it, since it was a college town, there was all sorts of eclectic people there. There was a rugby team. There was me and my artist friends. Uh, I brought some heavy metal uh, headbangers with me. <laughs> One guy who, who was from the band uh, uh, Ronnie James Dio. Some of you know that uh, heavy metal band, and Dio is an Italian word for God. Uh, anyway, during this party, one of the rugby guys decided to keep putting shots of Irish whiskey in front of me. And I kept saying, no, 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 but he said, yes, yes, yes. And I said, okay, I just, just to get you to shut up, I'll drink the whiskey. So one turned into five, turned into six, and then one beer turned into six more beers. And then pretty soon, I was wasted. And my two heavy metal uh, friends picked me up, put me in the car, took me home, and put me in my uh, apartment. And one of them said, are you going to be okay? And I said, I'm fine. Just le let me go to sleep. I'll be fine. Well, as soon as he turned his back... I felt immediately sobered, and I knew, I am so sick and tired of my life. This is it. I'm going to do something so drastic, something's going to change tonight. I marched over to the kitchen. I opened the kitchen uh, drawer. I grabbed the biggest knife I could find, and I gouged my wrist with it. As I was doing that, I realized, wow, you really have to work hard to kill yourself. And I was even failing at that. So even in life, I was uh, failing trying to kill myself. So the next morning, well, I should say, at some point that night, my wife found me passed out on the bathroom floor with this wound in my in my arm and my wrist. And um, she kind of shook me awake and told me, you got to go to the hospital. And I said, no, I'll go tomorrow when I'm sober. So she said, okay, <laughs> she was probably, I know, done, finished with me at that point. And I knew in my heart of hearts, our marriage at that point was over. I was ashamed. I was humiliated. I was at the rock bottom. And so the next morning I went to the ER, got stitched up, 42 stitches in my left wrist. And the doctor says, you know, since you've admitted this is a, this is a self-inflicted wound, I have to call a, med a, a, a mental health professional to come and talk to you to make sure you're going to be okay. Uh, at that point, I didn't care about anything. So sure, I'll talk to whoever. I don't care about my life. I don't care about anything. But I knew I had a little bit of hope that the pressure cooker of my marriage was going to be um, over with and so I could actually deal with life somehow. So the, the mental health professional they called walked in the door and his name was Jim. And Jim spoke with an Irish accent. So here I was, at, uh, the day after St. Paddy's Day, having getting drunk on Irish whiskey, they send an Irish doctor to talk to me, a psychologist. And he was a very kind gentleman in his Irish brogue, and he taught me that I can, uh, he trusted that I was going to be okay. And I told him that I had a therapist that I was seeing, and he thought, okay, I'm going to contact him, and you're going to be in good hands adios, I'll release you to go. So I thought that was a funny coincidence, one of many. Um, that started my journey. Um, I was a shell of a person after that day. I had some hope, I, like I said, the pressure cooker was turned off. Um, I had some hope that I was going to get better, but I didn't know how. So for the next six months, during that year, I was a shell. I was just a walking zombie. I was just sort of numb. And in this zombie numb state, I walked out of a drugstore in Pomona, California. And I remember this day very vividly. Outside the drugstore were two teenage girls, 15, 16 years old, giving out candy canes. This was December, around the holidays. They were giving out candy canes. And I was like, sure, I'll take a candy cane, no problem. 
And I asked the girl, I said, why, why are you doing this? And she said, we just want to tell people that God loves you. And I, I kind of paused. I'm like, do you want my money? Or do you, am I supposed to buy this candy cane? And she's like, no, just God loves you. That's all. And I took the candy cane and I walked away. And attached to the candy cane was a card. And it was the, the name and address of a local non-denominational Christian church. And I thought, well, you know, maybe I'll put the card in my pocket just in case. And so I put the card in my pocket and I ate the candy cane and I went home. For six months, I drove by this church just because it was on a main uh, busy street in my, in my city. And every day that I drove by this church, it was like a magnet was trying to pull me inside. Now, let me back up a little bit and say that I had been to a non-denominational Christian church because a, a, a girlfriend, a, a girl that I was using <laughs> to make myself feel good, uh, I'm ashamed of that now, she took me to this church because she thought it would do me some good. I thought the people carrying Bibles into this church were goofballs. I thought Christians were nuts. And so I didn't want to become one. Um, I now carry a, a Bible myself. So we'll get into that in a little bit. So the very people that I thought were goofballs, I now am a goofball. Um, but I'm a joy-filled, uh, fearless goofball. Um, so... Here's this card, and I'm driving by this church every day for like six months, and I finally can't take the, the, um, the draw is pulling me so hard, I go. I drum up the courage to go into the parking lot, and that's as far as I got. One Sunday, I sat in my truck, and I looked at the front door, <laughs> trying to go inside, but I couldn't. I was too scared, and I knew they were going to figure me out, figure that I was just a fraud, and I was a big, you know suicide case and I was just a miserable wretched person and they were going to just humiliate me so I left the next week I was so guilt-ridden for not having the bravery to go to the church that I finally did drum up the courage to go inside and I one Sunday I slipped past the the greeters at the front door hi how are you and I slipped into the back row and I slunched down uh, as low as I could get uh, just to check all this place out and see what was going on well it, some amazing things happened that day. Um, a guy came up behind me and put his hand on my shoulder, and um, his name was Jim. And Jim put his hand on my shoulder, and he said, Hi, how are you? We're, we're glad you're here. I don't know what, what was going on with Well, I do know what was going on with Jim. He was filled with the love of God. And when Jim put his hand on my shoulder, it was like my, my body just melted. And like the love of God just, just, just hit me. And um, when I looked up, and I looked up in his eyes, he was filled with love too. And I want to add too that as this uh, church service began, something really, and all I can say was a supernatural experience happened. As the, the service was progressing, a, a, a movie inside my mind began to play. And it was like God himself was telling me, I have orchestrated all of this just to get you here so I can talk to you. Finally, after you know, 26 years on the planet. And all these coincidences, these coinkydinks, like I like to call them, uh, Ronnie James Dio, Dio meaning God, uh, Jim, the uh, Irish psychologist, the day after St. Paddy's Day, uh, another Jim uh, who was at this church who just put his hand on my shoulder. Um, I saw all these things just sort of instantly just flash through my mind. And, and it was like, really, God was saying, you're here where I can finally use you and heal you. I've got your attention. And um, that's when I surrendered. And so uh, I'm, I'm talking to Jim, and I see in his eyes what I saw in the eyes of those two teenage girls outside the drugstore. Peace and calm, something I was desperate for, something I had never experienced in my life. Um, to make my testimony shorter, um, to make a long story short, those people in that church didn't know me from Adam, but they loved me, and they loved me, and they kept loving me. And the more they loved me, the more I wanted to go back. At one point, I gave up. I surrendered to this Jesus that they worshipped. And the more that I got to know this Jesus, the more I read the Bible. The more I read the Bible, the more I wanted to read the Bible. The more I worshipped God, the more I wanted to worship God, the, my appetite to worship became insatiable. And so I remember thinking six months after that, 
I am now experiencing peace. And the peace that I'm experiencing is actually bubbling up over to joy. For the first time in my life, I had gone from feeling stress, anxiety, fear, uh, and all of that, and panic and agoraphobia, to now, for the first time in my life, ex experiencing joy. I didn't know joy was possible. Um, and one thing just plagued me, though, that, that it still stuck with me. I knew that fear was still there, that anxiety, I still had it. I, I, I was not cured. I was not, uh, it got better. The symptoms were less, but it was still with me. And I, I really kind of challenged God, and I said, God, if you created the universe, uh, if, you've, if you've given me hope, and you've given me joy, and you've given me peace, why can't you take this away permanently, you know? Um, and so that started a, a conversation. Thankfully, in, in, this, in this time, I met a tremendous woman. I met my soulmate, and her name is Heather, and, and she and I got married, and, and she was, like me, she was sold out to this God that was healing us and making us whole. And we, we found that when we prayed for people, that other people got healed. You know, Jesus says in the Bible that, that these are the signs that follow them that believe that they lay hands on the sick and the sick will recover. We're oddballs enough to believe that that's true, that the Bible is the truth. And we started seeing people that we prayed for get healed. Uh, I, I prayed for a man in, in intensive care, a man I didn't even know. I'd never met him till that day. Um, he was the, the, the father of one of my employees. And I'd been praying for him. And I just had this hunger and desire to go pray for him one day in, while he was in the hospital because I knew he wasn't doing well. Long story short, he left the hospital a, about a week later. And the doctor said, you're healed and we don't know why. And um, his daughter said, you know, I don't know if you know this, but he only had about six hours to live the day you went to pray for him. And so things like that started to happen. We, we prayed for a couple that uh, the doctor said, you, you can't have children. And we talked to them and we asked God, what, what's, the, what's the wrong with them, God? And he showed us and we prayed and ministered to them. And within six months, they were pregnant. And so things like that started to happen, um, but, it, but it was still gnawing at me that I wasn't healed in here. I still had fear. Not as great as it was, not like it was in the old days of, of panic and, and agoraphobia, but I knew it was still resident. You know, it still was there. And so that bugged me. And so I, was re I went into a season of just really fasting and, 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 and doing what, what the Bible tells us to do. Seek God. Ask, seek, and knock. So I was asking, seeking, and knocking. And the, God brought my wife and I down to a ministry in, in Georgia, and they taught us um, the, 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 how to seek deeper roots of healing, uh, especially trauma. And as a result, um, I gained uh, tools, tools in my tool belt to heal other people and to heal myself. And so I started walking out what they call walkout. And so I started walking out, doing my homework, reading scriptures, and trying to really get to the root cause. Why do I have fear? Well, God in his great mercy, he really healed me. Ironically, my wife and I were ministering to someone else, to uh, um, an another, another woman, a friend of hers. And in the midst of that session, while we were ministering to that woman, I got healed. And um, I'll go into that in greater detail, but I'll, I will just say this that I had a physical experience when I, I, I asked the Lord to heal me and I took authority over fear. The Bible says that God didn't give us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. So if God says, I didn't give you a spirit of fear, then somebody did. A spirit of fear did come upon me at some point. And I, some of you may think that's goofy, but I know for a fact that it was with me and it left. And I had a physical manifestation of it leaving to the point where I looked up at my wife and her friend and I said, guys, 35 years of fear is gone. Fear, stress, anxiety, nervousness, worry, dread, panic, agoraphobia, it just left me. And I was in peace. I, 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 I was in peace before, but now I knew that that thing that had plagued me for 35 years was gone gone absolutely gone and and god wants to do that to you he wants to heal you he wants to give you hope so when you wake up in the morning you say hallelujah i'm alive god wants you doing cartwheels down the street because you're so happy 
And then when you're doing cartwheels, he wants you to say, when people are to come up to you and say, hey, why are you doing cartwheels? I'm doing cartwheels because the God of the Bible is real and he's healing me. He's, he healed me of all my diseases. Psalm 103 says God heals all your diseases. Do you have anxiety today? Do you have post-traumatic stress disorder like I did? The God of the Bible wants to heal you. He wants to set you free. Maybe even more than you want to be set free. That is the, that's the Reader's Digest version of my, of my testimony. Um, like I said, I want this video to be the first of many of walking you through step by step how that happened. Now, uh, I'm going to add a little caveat. I'm a born again Bible believing Christian. And, and the techniques that I'm going to teach you from here on out have to do with the Bible. If that doesn't interest you, then I really can't help you because therapists didn't help me. They, 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 they listened to me and they were helpful and kind. No one helped me but the God of the Bible and Jesus, his son. I want you to hear me. Therapists didn't heal me. Alcohol didn't heal, heal me. Uh, nothing, the abusing women <laughs> didn't heal me. Nothing healed me. Uh, Eastern religions didn't heal me. Meditation, uh, nothing healed me, but Jesus healed me. <laughs> I want you to heal, hear me. I am healed today, and I'm in my right mind. I'm prospering because of one person and one person only. His name is Jesus. He walked 2,000 years ago on the planet. He died on a cross. He was buried. And when he rose, 500 eyewitnesses saw him, ate food with him, and some of them even touched him. And they recorded these things. So that now we have 24,000 manuscripts of those eyewitness accounts. <laughs> They are trustworthy. My goal is to help you and give you encouragement because a lot of you right now watching this video have no hope. You are filled with fear. You are, you are filled with anxiety. You are filled with dread and you can't turn it off. You're like I was. Your, your heart is going pop, 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 and you can't turn it off. It's fear. It's anxiety. It's nervousness. It's stress. It's worry. It's dread. I've been there. You can take pills. You can take drugs, they will manage your symptoms. And that's okay. But if you want to be free, absolutely free, then Dr. Jesus is here to heal you. Thank you so much, everybody, for taking the time to watch this video. I hope it's encouraged. You leave me comments uh, here on my channel. Um, and I'm going to include in this channel eventually contact information where you can contact me and um, and again, I'm going to put more videos up here to show you point by point, step by step, how you will be healed. God bless you. Bye-bye.